Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Hebrews chapter 10, in the very first verse, the Bible says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which are offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance uh, again made of sins every year. For it, is, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh unto the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither has any pleasure in uh, any pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He, maketh, he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. <clears throat> By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And we'll, uh, we'll stop reading there. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you do for New Testament church. Lord, we pray that we be allowed to stand strong and you would strengthen us to do so in the last days in which we live. Lord, let us be a witness and let uh, us follow your guidance. Uh, never will we uh, leave the word of God. We pray now that you would bless your holy word to the hearts of the hearers. Lord, stir us up by the Holy Ghost and we would be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, especially since Brother Jarrett uh, just read at least three or four of them. Uh, but uh, this letter written to the original church, First Baptist uh, Jerusalem, with some things that they had began to embrace. Now, every culture that receives the gospel tends to keep a peach piece of the culture that they came out of. Now, if you read the Corinthian letter, uh, those people were Greek. They were very ungodly. They were get, very much given to idols, and, and, and they were very carnal, uh, lots of sexual sin. And you can see that th theme through Paul's letter saying, put that one out from among you. The next time you come together, exclude him. Get him out of your way. And that was their type of problem. Well, the church at Jerusalem, their type of problem was this, and it was the law. They had grown up that way. They were died and bred in it, and that was who they were. So as the writer, whether it be Paul or whether it be some other individual, it is not ever signed or given the signet, whomever wrote to them began to address their beliefs concerning works, their beliefs concerning the Jewish law, and wherein they, they were in error on thinking the ability of the law still could, still could be. Now, apparently this was an a, a ongoing problem for the church at Jerusalem, because remember when Paul went back to Jerusalem, he says this, I withstood Peter to his face. Now, Peter was their pastor, and he says, you are adding works back to this. He withstood him to his face, and he says, you know the law is dead. It is no longer in effect. And so we find that whatever culture you're brought up in, uh, you tend to keep at least a piece of that with you. 
And sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's not so good. Uh, uh, I was, I guess, about in my early, mid-twenties, mid-twenties, I guess, when I quit, quit believing, if you say this little prayer, everything's going to be fine. And uh, me and, and Brother Jody was just talking about that. And when you begin to push those things aside, you're going to lose friends. And uh, people are not going to like you as much. But now this, I'll say this. The good, the good thing is this. I have very little of that left in me. I was so young that uh, I, uh, I don't have any tendency or pull to lead someone through a sinner's prayer. And, and I'm glad of that. But also being raised in a uh, church that was a little bit more lively than most sovereign grace churches, I have a lot of that left in me. That's just how it is. And I believe Paul understood the culture of the, of the Jewish people better than even probably Peter did because Peter wasn't a very educated man, but Paul was. And Paul knew what was going on. And so he used that to his benefit and addressed the problem. They were cultural issues that they were bringing in to New Testament teaching. So in the first verse, it says, the, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. <clears throat> Excuse me. He begins to address uh, the purpose of the law. Now, uh, what does the New Testament say that the law is for us in the modern day Christianity? It says that the law is our schoolmaster. And the schoolmaster has two lessons. Well, <clears throat> when I taught school, when I taught nursing, I had, I had uh, five subjects I taught in a year. Two one time and three the next, the next semester. And then we were done. Uh, the law didn't have but two. The law's lessons was this. Number one, sacrifice. And number two, the inadequacy of man. That was the whole lesson. Very easy to get. You think, oh man, I could have picked up on that on first day. No, you can't. Uh, without the intervention of grace, you would still think that man was adequate, that he had something worthwhile in him, that he had some kind of tiny a bit of ability to accomplish something in and of himself. And, and so we see that Paul reminds the church, or whomever the writer is, who reminds the church at Jerusalem, this is the purpose of the law. For the law, having a good shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. In other words, all that there was an inadequacy in that system. Now, uh, we won't get there, but I, I did look it back at some, and there were sacrifices literally for everything. Now, a lot of it was willful sin, such as fornication or, or, or uh, uh, stealing something from somebody. And for every uh, description of sin you could imagine, there was a remedy. Uh, we work a lot with Amish people, and they have some crazy remedies for some crazy, crazy things. And, and, and man, they believe in them. And the Jewish, was, the Jewish law was like that. And as I was studying some in the law, preparing, there was even a sacrifice for leprosy. Now, leprosy really was a, was a medical condition. It still exists even today. And the thing for leprosy, I can't remember the sacrifice, but I want to say it was two turtle doves. And you took the turtle doves and they, and they put the blood on the mercy seat and then they put that blood on the, right, on the tip of the right ear to show what you had done. Now, that, that seems foolish to us, but if you were dead, dripped in it, it would seem natural. It, it would seem appropriate. It would seem like the thing to do. And, and so that was, the, that was the difficulty of the church at Jerusalem was understanding grace, the unmerited favor of God in all things. He says the law was inadequate. Verse 2, for then would they have not ceased to be offered? He said if Christ did away with if they were effective, why did Christ get away with them? Why did he put that away? Would they have not ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. Now, even among the redeemed, 
sad but true, uh, we have conscience, knowledge, remembrance of sin. Uh, and you know what? Th th this is a good measure of redemption. You know, I've had a lot of people down through the years, Brother Larry, how can I know that I'm saved? And I believe you most certainly can know, and I most certainly believe you can doubt it sometime too. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is your best measure. What do you think about sin? Do you, do you, do, is it enticing? Does it sound good to you? Man, that would be fun. Or, do you ha I wish I had never done that. that. That's a good measure of where you're at. And, and, and so we find here that the consciousness is not the awareness, it's what you think about sin. What is, what is your response to it? Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, meaning the Judeo sacrifices, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. And in the holies of holies, the back portion of the temple, they would go one year with the, the annual sacrifice, and it would be a lamb, and it would be perfect, and they would cut the throat, and, and the priest would go in behind there and make the atonement and, and pour it out, and every year, oh yeah, I'm still a sinner. I'm still a sinner. I, 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 it's still inadequate. I'll still need more. I'll still be more. Now, when I was a young preacher, I, I really would get irritated and probably to the point of anger of people who believed in a works-based salvation. I'm like, I just want to go, you idiot. But now that I've gotten older, I have pity on them like Paul did the Jews. Could you imagine that thinking to yourself, I've got to do more. I'm not doing enough. I, I, I'm not adequate in the sight of the Lord God. And I'll tell you, the two biggest groups of that is Church of Christ people and Holiness Pentecostal. And you know what? I would constantly live in fear if that was my belief. Would you not? I mean, if you really say you believe that, then you would have to live in fear that you were going to mess up even while you were in your sleep. Right? And Paul was reminding the church of Jerusalem, hey, that's not necessary. That, you're, you're missing it. You, you don't understand. And, and so we find that Paul wanted the church of Jerusalem to be wholly understanding of the sacrifice, of what the sacrifice was about. Verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world... He, meaning Christ, saith, sacrifice and offering, thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Now, I want you to see that the Lord God revealing his will, and in verse 5, if you have a Bible like this, it will reference some other verses in Psalms and Amos uh, concerning what the, about not having pleasure in those things. And so why did the Lord God not have pleasure? Because they were not adequate. They did not change our nature. They did not change who we were. And that was the inadequacy of the law, even from the beginning. Now think about Adam and Eve, the first sin, and the results thereof, very simple law to keep, don't touch those two trees. One, one credence, one, uh, uh, well, actually the law was this. Moses had to it. You know, that's man's idea is to add to the law. What was the real law? Don't eat of the true of the tree of which is in the midst of the garden. And then what did Eve quote the law to be? Don't cut, uh, 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 don't eat of the true, the uh, midst of the garden, and don't, and, and neither shall you touch it, lest you die. See, Adam had added to God's law. Where else would she have got this information? Because it's not what God said. The only other person at that time that existed was Adam. Now, uh, I don't know if Adam didn't trust Eve. If he thought he threw a little bit of power in there, she'd leave it alone more. But I want you to see, either way it did not work, and the end result was an inadequate sacrifice. It did not change their nature. One generation left, you, you literally had one sibling killing the other. 
And so we see the inadequacy of the law. Rules, do this, don't do that. Uh, there's no knowledge of the person of the Lord God in that at all. Verse 7. Then said I, meaning Christ, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now, I want you to see that the, uh, the whole ministry of Christ was this was to fulfill the law of God. That, that's what he came to do. He, he, he did not come uh, to, to be a special individual. He did not come. His, his mission, his reason for coming was to fulfill the sacrifice and let every no, one know right. that God is real. Right. Amen. Now, uh, I don't know how many people of y'all have seen a dead body three days in. Uh, the most I've seen is one probably 18 hours in. Not a pretty sight, especially in an August Tennessee afternoon. Uh, but can you imagine three days, 72 hours, and the Almighty God of Heaven, Lazarus, oh boy. Remember when they were going to roll back? What, what did old Martha? Uh, remember Martha said, and Martha was like me, a little self-righteous, wasn't she? And she said, and he says, Lazarus shall live again. Oh, I know he'll live in the coming of the last day. And uh, Martha rolled the stone back. Then that's where the rubber met the road. Remember her response? <laughs> Lord, by this time he stinketh. And boy, he would have. Except God made him living again. Lazarus, come forth. See, those were the reason of Christ's ministry. What is the ultimate sentence of the law? Death. Right? Every one of us, under the sound of my voice, unless Jesus returns in our lifetimes, we are going to die and be planted next door. Right? That, that, that is what's going to happen. Uh, not pleasant words, but the reality uh, very much so is that that will be our ultimate end. But see, we have one that's more powerful than death. One that said, Lazarus, come forth. The one that they were on the way to the funeral home, he said, hey, wait on a minute. That woman's going to starve to death if I don't do something. He took the boy by the hand and raised him up back to life. See, that's who we serve. The end of the law is death. But see, Christ is the giver of life. That, that, that is the difference. And as Paul was writing, whomever was writing to the church at Jerusalem, he was saying, don't get hung up on the law. Verse 8, above when he said sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings of sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst thou pleasure therein, which are offered by the, by the law. Now, this has been in my lifetime, and I know each of you here, and I think Brother Jared even mentioned this, this return of the Messianic Jew, uh, you know, wanting to go back to the law and I have acquaintances that do that, and they, they observe uh, me. They don't observe the sacrifice, but they do everything else. They do, uh, I'm trying to think of the one they do in the fall of the year. And even to this day, they still observe it. See, Paul was saying, don't do that. Don't, you, you know, I really believe <laughs> if this group don't get a hold of what they're doing, What's to keep them in one generation from adding the sacrifice back? Because mm -hmm. if you keep doing one thing, mm -hmm. it will lead to the other. Right. And, and, and so we see then, as the Lord's people, that Paul was simply saying the law was inadequate. It wasn't what the Lord God thrilled in. Verse 9, Then said he, meaning Christ, Lo, I cometh to do thy will, O oh God, he taketh away the first, meaning the law, that he may establish the second, which is grace, by which will we are sanctified. Now, by which one? He, the last one he says, by 
uh, to establish the second, to establish grace, to establish his love, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. It's done. It's finished. He offered the sacrifice for his people, and there's no need for nothing else. I like baptism, but when the Lord saved me, it was finished, it was done. Uh, there was no need for baptism except to be obedient unto the Lord that saved me. There, there was no grace in it. There was no redemption in it. There was nothing but a picture of the resurrection of Christ. And same thing with the Lord's table, and I believe we're about ready to observe it again very soon. There's no, there's no power in that. But the, it even says of itself, what? It is a remembrance. Now, in, in, in our front room on the piano, we, uh, we have two electronic picture machines. Because you can't put a lot of pictures on the wall, so we started to get these little things in it. Flashes of Sarah and Adam and Bella and Matthew and all my grandchildren. And the other one, I have pictures that are 150 years old that no one knows who they are but me, and, and they, they flash up and tell us hello every once in a while again. Now, is that my great, great grandmother? No. She'd been buried almost 100 years. It's a remembrance of her. It's just what she looked like. And very same, when we do observe the Lord's table, there, there's, no, there's no spiritual power in that. And, and uh, you know, the Catholic people, and I think a lot more believe it than the Catholics, if you would uh, get them down and pinned on the floor with it, they literally believe that becomes the, the body and the blood of Christ. And the Bible itself says, thinking like that puts him to an open shame. You want to shame the person of Christ? And so as the writer is writing, he says, listen, it's all a grace. That's done away with. One offering, one time, and it's done. Verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering sometimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. You know what? People that believe in baptism, regenerate, baptismal regeneration, I wonder what they do with this. Think about all people that went down to the River Jordan to be baptized of John. It says, the Bible says, confessing their sins, they were baptized in Jordan. Mm -hmm. And uh, never says one time that any of them were saved, does it? Never says there was any regenerative quality in that. In fact, when, when it came time, the Bible says that John pointed to Christ and said, Behold the Lamb of God. He cometh to take away the sins of the world. And he said, and that they wanted to stay with him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God. What am I in comparison to that? And again, the inadequacy of what so many believe concerning salvation. And, and so he points them, he points them to the uselessness, to the inadequacy of the law. But this man, meaning Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And even there this morning, making intercession for my blunders, Amen. for my difficulties, for your difficulties, for all the redeemed that make up his people, even now, still saying, he's mine, I bled for him. I died for him. He belongs to me. He's a mess, and he gets messier every day, but he belongs to me. That's right. That's it. That's all, all, that's all that is needed. Now, go with me uh, to Hebrews 6.6, 6, just a, a little further back. Hebrews 6.6, 6, the Bible says, If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, 
they put him to an open chain. Now there's two things that I sincerely believe that does this, crucifying Christ afresh, this doctrine of trans transfiguration, I can never say that word right, but when the Catholic priest takes that piece of bread and, and dips it into wine and pops it in the mouth of his group, they're putting Christ to an open chain. They believe that literally becomes the blood and body of Jesus Christ. It puts him to an open chain. It says week by week, you need to die again. It wasn't adequate. It wasn't enough. You need to die again and again and again and again. When the Bible says in of itself, he sat down and said it's done. He said at the right hand of God and said it's over. Uh, it's sufficient for those that believe. And he reminds them for the fact, don't bring the law back. Don't bring the law back to it. Verse 12, for when, for, oh, I'm sorry, wrong verse. Now I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 6. Now we certainly know that it's all of grace. And we're going to look at a different church letter to a different type of people. And we've already talked about the Corinthian church and what a mess it was in. I will say this, Paul didn't cut them off. Paul didn't say, you're an idiot. Paul did not say, we're done. But notice what he says, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 15. A group of Gentile believers. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Now you think about yourself every day. Your body is a member of Christ. It is part of who he is. It's a part of New Testament Baptist Church, right? He said, he, he wrote in his, in his, Lord Jesus, in his own, he says, you are members of one body. And Paul wrote, does, does the body say, foot, I don't need you. Foot's pretty important, isn't it? Mouth, I don't need you, mouth. Well, how are you going to make your needs known? How are you going to eat? How are you going to breathe well? We, we, we need everything. We need every piece that makes up this body. And, and, and singularly, Corinth, he was telling comfort, Corinth, that, listen, each of you make up the body. How well are you doing that? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a, har a, of a harlot? God forbid. So that means uniting yourself with other, with other things, other groups, other organizations. Uh, uniting yourself with stuff you know does not coincide with the scriptures. And, and they were also, he was also talking very much, and get more detailed in a minute, about, uh, about Mary and sexuality. He said, you have no, you have no, business whatsoever being involved in that. You, you have no reason. Christ gave himself for you. He died for you. <laughs> you, need to, you need to serve him. Verse 16, what? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body or that, that when they join together, when they have relations, don't you know that they're joined as one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. Who do you want to unite with? Who do you want to be with? Who, who, who do you want to be part of being part of you? Very serious question. Verse 17. But he that is joined in the Lord is one spirit. In other words, when, when you're in the will of the Lord... You're, you're in tune with the Lord. He'll guide you in the right direction. I think Brother Jared was just saying that he read that scripture this morning when the Gentiles were, were doing what was contained in the law and they had never even read the law. See, if you're being guided by him, it's, it, it's a good thing. You're, you're going to do fine as long as you're in singleness of heart with the Lord Jesus. 
And, and you won't have to worry. And he, he reminds them of that. You're supposed to be saved individuals. Verse 18, he begins to give us some very specific things. Flee fornication, sexual bond outside the marriage bond. He says, you need to get away from that. And it's easy to say, oh, oh, Brother Larry, amen, I, I have never done that. What do you rejoice in it on TV? Do you clap your hands when the filth is going on on the soap operas? Do you desire to see that mess? Flee it. Get away from it. Don't, don't be involved in it. What's your Facebook account? Uh, see where that, that, that is leading you uh, uh, as an individual. And again, he, he, he told the Jerusalem church, be careful of depending on works. And he tells the Greek Gentile church, listen, <laughs> what, you do is, what you do is who you are. And the reason why is because they believe such totally different cultural things that this is the one that he emphasized. Flee fornication. Every sin a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Now, if nothing else should make you stop, and hold your breath. If you're redeemed, you give a long thought. It's where you're going, you're taking the Holy Ghost with you. You go to smoke pot, you're taking the Holy Ghost with you. You go to get drunk, you're taking the Holy Ghost with you. If you're redeemed, right? I mean, there, there's no other conclusion to reach from that verse, right? It's uh -huh. like, Dragging your newborn baby through the mud, is it not? Only worse. Only, only in a worse sense of the word. See, we as Lord's people, and I fully believe this, if we truly, truly put Him first in our lives, there's nothing else to worry about. You don't, you don't have to wonder, hey, could this be wrong or could this be right? Just be led by God. Be led by the Holy Ghost. And, and you'll be fine. You, you will be fine if you genuinely belong to Him. So He reminds the Greek church, get away from this mess. Get away from the, the, the Gentile things and serve Christ. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. Now, for the first two centuries of this country, and uh, for another hundred years after we were out from under the rule of Great Britain, slavery was a very much a part of our country. Nothing to be proud of. Really, if I understand the Bible correctly, it's really nothing to be ashamed of either. It is what it is. Now, this is my theory and why so much hate teaching concerning slavery is taught in our public school. They do not want you to know what a slave is. And they certainly, to the degree redeemed, don't want you to know that you are one. <laughs> What's a slave have to do? Whatever his master says. Mm -hmm. That's pretty rough, eh? Mm -hmm. I was born and raised about as redneck as you can get. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And if you like it, good. And if you don't like it, that's good too, right? That's how I always talk. It's just about as far from the Bible as you can get. Because what I do, or it should be what it's do, what my agenda should consist of is what he says, I do. And if he doesn't say it, I don't. And when he says, Larry, jump. Master, how high would you like me to jump? That's a hard way for this flesh to live, is it not? But you'll find it at the most happy days of your life. You, you, you will, it, it will be a thrill and a joy. Now, the other side of slavery is this. 
You know what? The master had to provide for the slaves. He had to give them something to eat. Now it may not have been, it may not have been the very best of the best. It wasn't steak with A1, but he had to give them something. See, I sometimes in church services it gets pretty major, don't it? Same old thing. God's sovereign, five points, blah, 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 right? But see, God's good. Maybe I needed that one more time. Maybe that's exactly what I needed. And, and so we see then, that met with that, they had to have a place to live. They, the slaves in the United States had to have a place out of the weather, and they had to have food to eat. And, and what, does, what does Christ say that we were to have? With food and raiment, be there with content. That, that, that's one up from food and raiment, isn't it? Food, raiment, shelter. And, and so we see then, if we begin to see ourselves as slaves, He is going to provide for us, and we are going to do exactly what He says. Verse 20, for ye, now this is, you think about slavery, now you think about this. For ye are bought with a price. A price. Now, what, what's a good price? I mean, I'm thinking about getting another vehicle, and the more I look at them, the less I think about it. I just pray for the old white pickup every day as I head out to work and hope I get one more day out of it. Right? <clears throat> But if I bought a vehicle, you know, uh, I guess uh, even a decent vehicle these days, and this is sometimes used, is $30,000. That's a lot of money. That's three times, four times what me and Donna paid for our first trailer. We paid seven for it. <laughs> and uh, 30000 a lot more than $7,000, isn't it? And, and you're like, man, how can I do that? Well, this is the price you paid for you. And, and think about it. I buy me a, a new Jeep, right, Donna? I buy me a new Jeep and I bring it home. How many of y'all think I would really go get a bell bat and beat that car to death when I just paid for it? That's about makes sense. Because if you if you change the figures for what slaves cost in, in the day in that day of our country, you're talking somewhere between thirty and fifty thousand dollars. And it don't make any sense to me to beat up on something you just give that much money for. Now with that thought, think of what God gave for you. His own precious, dear, and lovely son in whom was no sin, who was part of him. You know, I, Brother Jared mentioned this, and me and Adam have talked to it as well, about understanding the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, whatever you want to call that, all being unison, all accomplishing the, the most sovereign will, and all in these different spheres at the very same time. That, 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 that's more than my W.T. Thomas brain can get around. Right? But I do know it's true. Now, with, with someone so magnificent giving his life for you, could he possibly ask too much from you? I don't, I don't think it's possible. I don't think if even this evening he said, Larry, you get Don and the girls, you head out for South America. At 54 years old, is that asking too much for me? Absolutely not. Man. What could I what could I refuse him? Because you know what? If it wasn't for him, even right now I'm as good as in hell. Even right now, I would be a, a sick, depraved individual. Even right now, I would have no interest in eternal things. <clears throat> so what could I refuse him? 
Where, where could I possibly say no? And so, and our time has run out, but when he says, church going to the old world, we do it. When he says, come out from among ye and be ye separate. Come out from among them and look different, act different, dress different, do different. What could he possibly ask more? We do it. it, it it's, no, it's no hurtful thing to serve God. Do you know him? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? 